Hello everybody and welcome to the second Stitch Raid story. This is Fazbear Frights number two, now, uh, Fetch. Uh, and it, yeah, this is this is the second Stitch Raid story. Uh, continuing from last time, if you haven't seen the first one, you should probably go read it uh, or listen to my audiobook. Um, yeah, this is a actual reaction to this one um, because I haven't actually read uh any of the Stitch Raid stories after the first one. So this is all going to be new for me. Uh, hope you guys enjoy. And yeah, let's, let's, let's go. <laughs> Grim wasn't always lucid. Well, now, it wasn't good to fib. The truth was that Grim was rarely lucid. Being lucid made his teeth hurt. His teeth hurt when his eyes and his ears hurt. When he was lucid, the world had this way of assaulting his eyes and his ears. Everything was too intense, too much. Grim preferred to hang out in his own crazy world where the voices in his head ruled, even when he knew they were crazy. Grim's teeth hurt tonight. In the shadows, pressed against the corrugated metal sides of a storage shed near the train tracks, Grim pulled his dirty pink acrylic blanket tighter around his body. Though the blanket was damp and provided no warmth, it comforted him. Also, because it wasn't just dirty, it was so filthy, you had to pry at the blanket fibres with a fingernail to find a hint of pink. It gave him camouflage. Camouflage was good. Ever since he'd walked away from his life, he'd done everything he could to be invisible. He hunched his five feet eight inches into several inches less than that. He ate just enough to keep skin hanging on his bones. He covered his long, stringy brown hair with a floppy grey hat. Uh, he hid his long face under a matted beard, and he gave up his name for the nickname he'd been given. He made it his goal to be unseen. He especially did not want to be seen right now. No way. No how. He, want, he didn't want to be seen because he didn't like the pounding and clanking, and he didn't like what he was seeing. He was seeing ominous things. Things that hurt his teeth. For the last five minutes, Grimm's gaze had been riveted on the railroad tracks, or again, tr truth was important, not on the tracks themselves, but rather what was on the tracks. What was on the tracks was disturbing him greatly. On the tracks, illuminated by the peripheral glow of a security light, a cloaked figure was prying bizarre items from the rails. The figure was slightly hunched and moving in on an in an awkward pitch and roll gait, that reminded Grimm of the way people walked at, after coming off a boat. Grimm was only 20 feet or so from the hooded person, but he could clearly see both the figure and what it was collecting. The person appeared to be unaware of Grimm, and Grimm intended to keep it that way. Grimm's teeth wanted to chatter, and his body wanted to shake, but he willed himself still as he watched the mysterious figure pound at the end of what looked like a foot-long pry bar with a bright yellow end. The yellow end kept wriggling free pieces of something Grimm couldn't identify. So far, he'd seen it collect a hinged jaw, a jagged row of what looked like bloody human teeth, mutilated, uh, I'm sorry, mutilated human eyes, uh, several bolts, a computer port, and chunks of metal with tufts of dark green fur. Obviously, this is the plush trap chaser. <laughs> um, now he continued to watch while the figure pried up one and then two green oblong objects. What were those? As if answering Grimm's inner question, the figure held up the pieces. Even in the muted light, Grimm could immediately discern what they were. In his previous life, he'd been a professor, and even at the rate he'd been prick, uh, pickling his brain cells, he still had many at his disposal. Green rabbit ears. Oh, his teeth. The figure went back to prying, and it worked free of the tracks, a large metal rabbit foot. Grimm had to admit to himself a modicum of curiosity about what the figure was doing, but his sense of self-preservation was stronger, so he sat with aching teeth, as still the bits of de 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 what is that word, as the bits the figure was collecting. Uh, until the figure put all the pried up parts in a bag and disappeared into darkness. Detective Larson knocked on the door 
of a one and a half story brown craftsman house squatting next to a two story craftsman for its four times its size. He looked down at the well maintained porch he stood on. It looked like it had fresh paint. He noticed the entire house was in similar condition, but the paint and tidiness wasn't weren't having what was possibly their intended effect. The house he stood in front of looked diminished, not just in relation to its bigger, stiff, spiffier neighbour, but in general. If houses had faces, this house would look hand dog. A mission-style door opened in front of Larson, a pretty young woman with almost cartoon large eye eyes and shoulder-length brown hair looked at the detective with absolutely no interest. Yes? Ma'am, my name is Detective Larson. He showed the woman his shield. He g she gave it the same non-attention she was giving him. As part of an ongoing routine investigation, I need to look at the premises. Do you have any objections? The woman squinted at him. He thought he saw the glint of something lying dormant in her gaze, like she had some spark that, that had been nearly but not fully extinguished. He wondered if that spark was about to light an objection to his entry. He didn't know what he'd do if it did because he didn't have a warrant. The woman shrugged. Come on in. Crossing the threshold into a meticulously clean and neat living room, he looked around and saw that a small kitchen and dining room were in similar condition. This in spite of the fact that the house contained at least four cats, which lounged in various displays of regal ownership on the backs of the furniture or in puddles of sunlight on braided throw rugs. I'm Margie. Ooh, I'm Margie, the woman said. She offered her hand. Larson took it. It was cool and limp. She looked up at him, one eyebrow raised, as if she was waiting for him to answer some unasked question. He smiled at her but said nothing. He wondered what she saw when she looked at him. Did she see the 30-something decent-looking guy he used to see in himself, or did she see the deep lines forming around his mouth and eyes, which was all he could see now when he caught a glimpse of his face in the mirror? She looked away, her gaze landing on two of the cats. She frowned and shook her head. Sorry about all the cats, I'm not sure how this happened. I was given one to keep me company after... Um... Well, just to keep me company. Ooh. Um, I know so I know some of you might be reading this just after reading Fazbear Frights 2 and you haven't read the other ones, but that makes a lot of sense, knowing who Margie is in a later story and what happened to her. Um, I won't spoil that for you. Uh, <laughs> but you know what I'm talking about if you know what I'm talking about. Turned out it was a she and she was pregnant. I couldn't bear to give the four kittens away. I felt like their mum and it seemed like abandonment. So, here I am, a cat lady. She gave a dry laugh, and then coughed. Larson had a feeling she used to laugh a lot, and had gotten out of practice lately. He wondered what had happened to her. He was tempted to ask, but that wasn't why he was here. Larson started wandering through the house. Margie followed him. How long have you lived here? he asked. He'd found that chatting with homeowners tended to distract them when he was checking out their place. It gave him more time to poke around before they started getting uncomfortable or even defensive. Just over three years, her voice hitched between three and years. He glanced at her. She sounded like she was going to cry, but her eyes were dry and her face was placid. I was hired to take care of a sick boy while his dad served overseas. Here we go. He passed away and left me the house. The dad or the boy? Larson wondered. He didn't ask. Larson had stepped into a short hallway with three doors. A, filth, a fifth cat appeared from inside the last door, not filth. It was a small grey tabby. It sat down in the middle of the hall and started cleaning itself. Larson looked into a small, shiny bathroom and then into a decent-sized bedroom, the one the woman was obviously using. A fuzzy yellow robe was folded neatly at the foot of a queen bed and cosmetics were lined up just as neatly on a cherry dresser. Other than those touches, he thought the room had a distinctly masculine feel. Larson decided not to comment on the woman's relationship with her dead employer, whatever that relationship might have been. He didn't need to risk sitting her on edge. He continued on down the hall. The old house creaked and shifted, emitting something that sounded like a groan. He was pretty sure Margie flinched at the noise. A dark grey cat meandered down the hall. 
sniffed the grey tabby, and then rushed against Larson's black slacks. He bent over and scratched it behind the ears. He knew he'd be sorry later. He was allergic to cats, but he still liked them. Stepping into what was obviously the second bedroom, Larson stared at the single bed in the middle of the room. Other than the bed, the room held only a small cabinet. He wasn't sure what to make of this room, but he was compelled to stay in it. Specifically, the cabinet grabbed his attention. Next to him, Margie was quiet. She was close enough for him to smell um, what he assumed was her soap or shampoo. It had a fresh but clean scent, nothing heavy or alluring like perfume or cologne. In spite of the makeup she wore, he got the impression Margie didn't care much about doing things to impress others. He wondered if that was why he found her attractive. He liked her simple transparency. No, she wasn't spilling her guts to him in the annoying nervous in the annoying way nervous witnesses often did, but she wasn't trying to be something she wasn't either. He could tell. He cleared his throat as he meandered around the bed toward the cabinet that had captured his interest. We've been pursuing a person of interest in the ongoing case I mentioned. The case has been at a near standstill. It's gone without any leads until recently. Now we have this. He reached into the inner pocket of his grey sports jacket and pulled out a photo, which he held up for Margie to see. Margie said nothing, but her face had a lot to say. First, she flushed. Then, as quickly as her cheeks went pink, they lost all colour, and she blanched. Her eyes widened. Her mouth opened slightly. He heard her breathing quicken. About to call her out on her reaction, Detective Larson did a stutter step of surprise when the grey tabby suddenly jumped onto the single bed. Sorry, Margie said again. She picked up the cat. It immediately started purring. Larson couldn't help himself. He reached out and rubbed the side of its face. Suddenly aware he was very close to Margie, he stepped back. The cabinet was right in front of him. He hadn't realised he'd reached it. Now he had to see what was inside of it. At the same time he was drawn to it, he felt an inexplicable reluctance to open the cabinet door. He sneezed. Excuse me, he said. It's the cat, Margie said. It's okay, he was lying. He'd be miserable the rest of the day. He realised he was putting off opening the cabinet, which is absurd. So he grabbed the cabinet knob and pulled on it. The cabinet was empty, but the walls inside of the cabinet weren't. They were covered in harsh black scribblings jammed close together. What looked like nonsensical letters made by a thick marker covered nearly every inch of the cabinet's interior. Larson could see no meaning in the scrolls, but nonetheless, they gave him the same th feeling he'd had when he'd looked at the recent grotesque death reports. Larson turned and looked at Margie. What happened in this house? <laughs> of course, I know what happened in the house because I've, I've read The Real Jake in Fazbear Frights. Uh, six, but if you haven't read that, then you, then just wait, <laughs> just wait, um, very good, very good, um, yeah, so that's, that was the second, uh, Stitch Wraith, this is getting interesting, um, as, as you know, the Stitch Wraith connects all of the stories together, and it's, it's very interesting, obviously the first part was about the plush trap, um, chaser, and that part was about, um, this kid, um, yeah, we won't talk about that just in case. I, I I don't know what to do here because I feel like I'm spoiling it, but at the same time, I, I feel like everyone already knows. Anyway, if you know, then you know. Um, yeah, I that's it. <laughs> I'm just going to end it here. Um, thank you so much for watching. Uh, if you want to watch part three, that will be out very, very soon. Uh, the entire playlist might be in the description. I don't know, but if not, there's a playlist on my channel. So go and watch all of them. Anyway, thank you for watching and I will see you later. Goodbye.